Good evening. The most remarkable case of poltergeist activity this century took place in 1977. It occurred in North London, and it's known across the world simply as the Enfield poltergeist. As you'll discover, it was one of the best documented and longest lasting cases. It provoked a storm of controversy. Was it the definitive proof of supernatural forces? Or was it at best a hoax, at worst a fraud? See what you think. We've reconstructed the case from the testimony of witnesses and investigators who were present at the time, including, for the first time, an in-depth interview with the family themselves. It was a warm summer's evening when it all began. Peggy Hodgson had just put the children to bed and was looking forward to a quiet night. She had no idea that her world was about to be turned upside down. Come on now, go to sleep, it's late. What's going on with all this noise? It weren't us, Ma. I heard you moving around. It's not us. Oh, now, don't lie. I heard you. Now, get to sleep. I've had enough of this. I saw the noise, Mum. I don't know, love. Oh, my God. Right, all of you, downstairs now. Come on, get your dressing gowns and slippers now. But where are we going to go, oh, Mum? I don't, I don't know. know. Come on, let's get out of it quickly. Come on. Billy, come on, help me out. Peggy Hodgson took the children to the safety of a neighbour's house. Jenny, come on! Come on! I found it really very nerve-wracking. I was trying to keep calm because of the children, you know, not to frighten them more than they already were. But it was very difficult. No, I can't forget it. I can put it out of my mind now. Only now, but before, I mean, most of, like, like my early 20s and in my middle 20s, I couldn't even talk about it like this. I'd be in tears all the time. At her wit's end, Peggy called the police. It was WPC Caroline Heaps and a colleague who answered the call. Well, we've done a complete search of the house, mm. including the loft, and we can't seem to find where the knocking's coming oh, from. But dear, I'm I... so sorry to put you to all this trouble, but I was really Don't worry. frightened. Yeah, it's no problem. Well, I see, I'm on my own. I mean, my husband left last year, and I've got no one else to. Yeah. My kids are here, and I don't know what to do, yeah. you see. There's probably some very simple explanation for all this. It's an old house. In full view of the Hodgsons, their neighbours and two police officers, a chair slid across the floor. The Hodgsons had a sleepless night and there was no let up the following morning. Janet, did you throw that? No. Billy? Margaret, was it you? No. <laughs> the fear that went through you, it could bring on trouble. Anyone older an heart attack, I think. It was that frightening. Over the following nights, the activity continued unabated. Within days, the national press had picked up on the story. No, John Burke and Peggy's brother. I live a few doors down. Thanks for coming. I don't quite know what you can do. She's One of the first to arrive was photographer Graham you. Morris. They were genuinely upset. I mean, they, they were sort of frightened. The kids were all right. A couple of them, I think, had gone to sleep by the time we got there. But all the other people were, were bristling a bit. They were on edge. So we didn't really know what was happening. And then we were told bit by bit, what was going on, what had happened. Hey, fellas, come back. You've got to see this. Come on. <laughs> Basically, it was down to my reactions, if I can catch anything. Um, and then got hit on the, hit 
on the forehead by a Lego brick. <laughs> well, that brought it home, yes. It became personal then. <laughs> but, uh, no, it was, uh, it was weird as, as all these things started flying around. You know, the bits and pieces that were flying around, not just as it hit me, but uh, yes, it was uh, the strangest feeling I've ever experienced. Into the chaos now stepped Maurice Gross, the local investigator for the Society for Psychical Research. As soon as he arrived, he realised that he'd been handed an exceptional case. Maurice Gross, uh, Society for Psychical Research. The atmosphere when I got there was absolutely chaotic. Uh, everybody was in a terrible state. Nobody knew what was going on. And this is one of the good things, as far as I was concerned about the case, is that uh, when I got there, I realised it must be genuine. Now, Peggy, if I'm to help you with this, I need you to make a record... The investigator was convinced that a poltergeist had moved into the Hodgson's home. He knew that his first task must be to try to calm the family's nerves. It's going to be all right. Then I explained to Mrs. Hodgson and the children, as best as I could, what poltergeist phenomena was about. Janet made me laugh because Janet even didn't even know what it was. She used to call it a polka dice. And I say to her, Janet, it's not a polka dice, it's a pol poltergeist. But she didn't, she didn't get it for quite a long time. It wasn't long before the investigator had an experience of his own. Was this the... Dr I thought, my God, you know, nobody's thrown that because there was nobody in a position to throw it. Now, if you drop a marble on the floor, it bounces. He used to hit the floor and stop, dead. And when you touched them, they were hot. Now, this is typical of all the, th all the um, uh, psychokinetic phenomena concerning small objects has ever been reported in poltergeist cases, that they were hot. Morris Gross then began his own investigation of the family to see who, if any of them, might be behind it all. Oh, I watched him like a hawk. I brought in my tape recorders and uh, I had those running all the time. And I watched everybody. And I realised nobody was doing anything. But did the children never play up? Being young girls and with so much attention, it seems hard to believe. Well... You two look very comfortable down there. Of course they played around sometimes. They're children. And any psychologist would tell you that children will imitate what's going on around them. But you can't fool people day after day, week after week, scientists and people coming in and countries everything, and nobody ever seeing anything done by the children. As the strange activity continued into September and October, the list of witnesses grew longer and longer. They included David Robertson, a physics research assistant from Birkbeck College, London. Do you get any sleep? Um, not really. Janet, can you tell me if anything else has been moving around besides all the magazines? Well, um, some Lego's been flying around. <laughs> that ashtray flew across the room and struck me on the side of the head, quite a blow. And um, at that time, I concluded that um, I had observed something paranormal and it probably wasn't wise to carry on with that line of experimentation. <laughs> Janet and her sister Margaret seemed to be at the centre of the activity, but were they responsible for it? Their uncle believed something was manifesting itself through Janet while she was in a trance. It actually yanked one of these old-fashioned old -fashioned gas fires literally out of the wall. Uh, and at one time, Morris and me we're trying to restrain Janet, who seemed to be, I'm no expert, only say in a trance-like state. And the power was, the strength was unbelievable. As summer turned to winter, the disturbances grew more violent. And then Janet started having fits. One night was particularly bad, and the doctor was called. He thought she was having some sort of fits. He gave her a 10 milligram injection of Valium. Now, a 10 milligram injection of Valium will knock her an adult out, let alone an 11-year-old child. And she immediately, more or less, went to sleep, unconscious, went to sleep. With Janet fast asleep, the adults returned to the living room. Who's that? Oh. 
Graham Morris took this picture on entering the bedroom, with the startled John Burkham in the foreground. There she was, curled up on top of a very old-fashioned type radio set. She was like she was on it. But the amazing thing was, she was asleep. Over the next few weeks, Graham Morris was able to take a number of pictures even while he was out of the room by pressing a remote control button. The pictures show the children coming out of bed, but are they playing up for the cameras? The pictures are genuine. There's no, no doubt about that. What the, the motive was behind them coming out of bed, I mean, people talk about them levitating. I find that very hard to believe. It looks like we're jumping, but believe me, I know that there's something pulling us up, and we're in this position where we're so terrified, trying to hang on to something, that mayhem was let loose, and we're just trying to hang on for dear life. The Hodgsons felt helpless, victims of a force they could neither see nor predict. I did feel at one time we'd got it for life. I thought, well, this is worse than the war. At least the war ended, but this is going on and on and on. It seemed the family could only wait while the poltergeist planned its next move. Quite a story, but the greatest drama was yet to come. After the break, the poltergeist speaks, and you'll have to judge for yourselves. Is this the voice of a dead man? And I fell asleep, and I died in a chair. By September 1977, the extraordinary goings-on in Enfield were front-page news. Reports were coming in of flying objects, sliding furniture, and possessed children. And it was all going on in broad daylight in front of dozens of witnesses. How was it going to end? The Hodgson Semi was turning into a war zone. Events were becoming more dramatic by the day. <laughs> Morius Gross decided he had to try to get in touch with the force before it did any serious harm. His chance came when the knocking started up again. I thought, well, if it can knock, and uh, it can make all these noise and do things. Perhaps we can get some sort of communication with it. Now, I know you can hear me. I want you to answer one knock for yes and two knocks for no. Can you hear me? Did you die in this house? How long ago did you live here? Are you having a game with me? <laughs> that was a very good answer. <laughs> uh, I was actually, you know, taken aback, but I was also my sense of wonderment at the time is, you know, I can't put it into words. That's extraordinary. If the knocks were to be believed, the Hodgson's poltergeist was an old man who had died in the house years before. Morris felt he was making progress. Morris. Mm. Mm. It's nearly eight. Oh, it's a cup thank of tea. You. I'm, I'm just going to see the kids. But then in December, when he thought there could be no more surprises, the most extraordinary episode of the case occurred. It started to speak. The voice phenomena started on December the 10th. I remember that day all too well. December the 10th, 1977. I was sitting in the in the room with uh, in the lounge uh, with uh, Mrs. Hodgson and the children, and suddenly a dog barked in the room. Morris. Come on, my name's Morris. Let me hear you say it. Morris. <laughs> Even I was taken aback. You know? It really was quite a shock to listen to hear it. The following reconstruction is based right. on the tape recordings taken running. by Morris Gross at the time. Everyone very quiet and very still. Where are you in the room at this moment? 
on top of Janet. Why are you lying on Janet's bed? Why can't she feel you? I'm invisible. Why? First of all, I thought it was discarnate voice coming from out of the air, you know, from nowhere. Then I realised the voice was coming from Janet. I said, Janet, that voice is coming from you. She says, no, it's not. I said, all right, if it's not coming from you, where is it, where is it coming from? She said, it's coming from behind me. Now, I want you to take a sip of this, but don't swallow it, all right? The investigators were mystified. Numerous tests were carried out on Janet to try to find the source of the sound. What is your name? My name's Bill. At one time, the voice is going in the room, and I'm talking to the room and asking him to show himself. He's saying, I can't. I'm dead. I said, don't worry about that. I've seen dead bodies. I've got no head. And that type of thing. And it ended up calling me a four-eye get go away. Are you all right, love? This won't hurt at all, I promise you that. Well, what's it for, Morris? Well, we need to find out where the voice is going. It seemed the mystery would be cleared up when the investigators borrowed a laryngograph from the University of London. It's a machine that closely monitors voice patterns. You'll find Is that on or And we found the voice was not made by the larynx, but by the false vocal fold, which is above the larynx here. And you only use it when you lose your voice and you talk like that. Right. Janet used to produce this voice for up to three hours at a time without Can even tell me any distress whatsoever. Well, you do that for a couple of minutes and you're in dead trouble with your throat. My name's Bill. Do you know that you're dead? Shut up. Morris tried to find out more about the person behind the voice. I want you to tell me whether you remember what happened to you before you died. I had a hemorrhage and I fell asleep and I died in a chair in the corner downstairs. Could this really be the voice of a dead man? For some observers, it was too much. The case seemed to be degenerating into a circus. Graham Morris was one witness who began to have his doubts about the poltergeist. I'd like to give a good reason why such and such happened. Um, I, th I just thought it got a bit far-fetched with, with voices. Uh, I'm not saying the voices weren't real. Um, just what was being the interpretation of, 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 the, uh, of the voices and, and just what went on. Morris Gross himself came under suspicion, accused by some colleagues of keeping the phenomena going at the family's expense. Here we were producing evidence for a fantastic case, and at the same time, we were able to help the family. Well, what more could we do? Uh, do you know, what? one time, somebody came along who said, leave the family alone, go away. It would be, everything would be all right. Guy and I, we did it, we went away for two days, and all hell was let loose. And she was delighted to see us come back again. So what else could we do? Well, he helped us extremely well. And without his help, I don't think any of us would be here now properly, not living there, maybe not in that house, maybe not having the life they're having now, maybe not even thinking right. Maurice Gross was accused of inciting the children, but he wasn't even there when David Robertson challenged the ghost. OK. Show us what you can do. Margaret, are you all right? What's going on in there? I saw Janet levitate in front of the windows, and somehow the thing would have her stretched out. You know, it was like she'd been laying on a bed. At exactly the same time, John Rainbow, a local delivery man, was passing the house. His account is read by an actor. I remember the curtains were billowing inwards and a young girl seemed to be floating around in the room, like she was in a bubble. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. 
Hazel Short was on duty outside when she spotted a red cushion on the Hodgson's roof. My attention was taken to the top window and I saw Janet floating or levitating up and down, just going up and down in front of the window, flat on her back. Um, I thought she was putting it on. So I went straight home, went upstairs, laid on my own bed and tried to lift myself up in horrors and then you couldn't do it. No way that I could do it. Two passers-by who had nothing to do with the family believe they saw a girl levitate. It seemed incredible. How could a young girl have faked such a thing? Maurice Gross remains convinced the children were not responsible. I thought to myself, well, how can it be the children? Because in the end, the situation was, if it was the children, we had the world's best conjurer there, we had the world's best ventriloquist, and we had the world's best everything, all from a little, a little 11 year old girl, which was, of course, ridiculous. By late 1978, the events began to die down as mysteriously as they'd started. Margaret thinks the poltergeist lost its hold over the family as they began to conquer their fear. Morris reckons if it, you showed your fear more, it would attract itself to you more. If something like little did move, I used to be able to say, oh, look, it's moved it again, you know, make a little, make a little bit light of it, although it wasn't really inside, you didn't feel light about it at all, but not letting it see that you was frightened. In July 1978, Janet, now 12 years old, was admitted to the Maudsley Hospital. There she underwent psychiatric tests, and the doctors gave her a clean bill of health. While she was there, for the first time, she felt completely calm. I think it did help her to re relax, because she, when she came out, she was quite excited. She said, the first word she said, they said, I'm perfectly normal. There's nothing wrong with me at all. That's the very word she used. And I was pleased to, to hear it and see it. Janet was allowed home from the Maudsley, and slowly the poltergeist activity died down in the autumn of 1978. Maurice Gross himself left, confident that the family were at last free of their troublesome spirit. Thanks very much, Maurice. We couldn't have got through this without you. 17 years on, it seems hard to believe that the strange events at Enfield ever took place. But for the investigator on the case, the Enfield poltergeist has changed his life for good. I must go. Bye-bye. Bye. My belief was very strong. But the difference now is my belief is absolute. That's the difference. Nobody could shake my experiences. With the poltergeist case, it made me realize that what I was doing was worthwhile and it was real. After the activity died away, Maurice Gross was left with his recordings and an unanswered question. The mysterious voice had clearly said that he, Bill, had died in the house, but Morris had never been able to confirm this. And then three years later, this letter arrived. A man wrote in to say that his uncle had died in the house, well before the Hodgsons moved in. We've traced his death certificate, and it's true, he did die in the house. His name was Wilkins, William Wilkins. But of course, everyone would have known him as Bill. Good night. <laughs>